I thank the gentleman from New York for illustrating, elaborating on, detailing, and bringing to the 21st century the horrors of the Tulsa race riots, calling it what it is, and not being fearful of acknowledging the riotous and violent impact of the Tulsa race riots. Madam Speaker, it's my honor to now continue the discussion on behalf of the Congressional Black Caucus and my co-chair of the Special Order Hour, the Honorable Congressman Torres of New York. Let me first of all thank our chair, Chairwoman Beatty, for matching her members uh, with this process of ensuring that the history, the unbiased history of a people in all of our variations is told truthfully. We too are Americans. The Tulsa residents of that time were Americans as well. I am reminded of the early stages of my education when Congressman Torres' history was the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. I could almost repeat that in my sleep. The three ships that came with Christopher Columbus. He was a founder of America over and over again. I'm not sure during the period of our early childhood and those of recent vintage learned anything of Native American history, Korean American history, Japanese American, Chinese American, African American, slavery, I don't know if our children in periods of the 20th century and now in the 21st century knew there was more history. I do know that the past president wanted the Smithsonian of African American culture to stop teaching about African history. I know that there was a challenge to the U.S. Department of Education by majority, minority leader, excuse me, to be corrected, McConnell, to stop teaching the 1619 Project. It baffles me because I believe that if a country or a people know its history, we will not be doomed to repeat the past. And when I say a people, America is represented by many people. If we knew each other's history, if we understood each other's history, could we not? even if not those who are already past understanding it, could our children grow up with empathy and understanding? That is why we're here on the floor of the house. We're not here to castigate and to throw untruthful hits. We're here to tell the truth. Madam Speaker, tears come to my eyes as a series, and I only get to look at television late in the night after all the day's work is done and there's a series called the Underground Railroad. You cannot look at that without shaking in your boots, shaking in the chair you're sitting in, tears coming to your eyes. That is the empathy that America can understand for all the journeys that so many of us have taken We've taken it and we're here in this place. The greatest experiment that the world watches, can they make it? And they were watching it from Abraham Lincoln's proclamation of the emancipation, 1863, and then General Granger in 1865. They watched us through the 1800s. We failed. Reconstruction did not work. Even with all the governors and Congress people that had been elected of freed slaves the land that they had, that ugly head of racism, white supremacy, lynching, the tearing asunder of black communities, the still tearing apart families, the lynching of men and women who went off to a grocery store, when I say that, the local store, whatever it was, down the road and never came back. 1921, <clears throat> boy, I, I, I'm just so proud of this picture. This is the bustling Tulsa, Oklahoma. This, this is the example of uh, the excitement 
I'm reading where it says the McGowan Variety Store. I have some McGowans in Houston. They might be related. These are the prancing with their cowboy hats on. It looks as if uh, students, just like we would see in our neighborhoods today or in our high schools today, dancers, they had a full holistic community. There's some cars on the street. Can you imagine 1921? Oh, I wish I could just take a trip back, just stand on the sidewalk and just look with pride of history I did not know. I never imagined there were cities like Tulsa, Oklahoma as I was growing up as a child. I never imagined we had anything, we were worth anything, except for what my mother and father and grandparents poured into me. My big mother, which was my great-grandmother who owned property, obviously destroyed Brother Torres by highways and freeways that came in and took it away in St. Petersburg, Florida. I just thought that was our way of life, just like I thought riding in the back of a train going south to visit her, sitting by my lonely with a bag of fried chicken. That's right, I'm not embarrassed to carry me through to visit my grandmother in St. Petersburg, Florida. Thank God I got there safely. I was just about eight or nine or 10, and I was sitting in the colored car. And I wasn't supposed to move except for necessary purposes. I didn't know. I didn't know I could come here and see this. And our children don't know it. That's why we're on the floor today. We're on the floor today because we have to begin to embrace each other's story. And so I'm very delighted that I'm leading on HRS 398, embraced by the Congressional Black Caucus. This will be on the floor of the House this coming Wednesday. And my counterpart in the United States Senate is a very dear friend, Senator Elizabeth Warren, who believes in this resolution that is the recognizing of the forthcoming centennial of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. And it doesn't say right, it says massacre. It was a massacre. Thank you to the House leadership. Thank you for their understanding the value and importance of this as we lead into June and begin to move on H.R. 40, the commission to study and develop reparation proposals. Nothing harmful, nothing that will undermine anyone. It is to accept what happened. I'm so grateful we have almost 100 co-sponsors and maybe more to come in the next 24 hours for a story that was never told. Oh yes, I could tell you about Columbus, tell you about Abraham Lincoln, tell you about George Washington. There's a little black girl and most of them today in the 21st century, they're not hearing about the wide diversity of our history, Madam Speaker, yours and mine, and the many people that are on this side of the aisle or that side of the aisle. And so let me just recount very briefly again, a century ago, white riders, local law enforcement, and self-appointed vigilantes claimed to be acting reasonably and in self-defense against what they feared was an upcoming black uprising. Same as January 6th, where there are people who had the audacity to say, look like tourists on any normal day when we were laying flat on the floor in this building while banging and screams and guns drawn on this side of that door. We didn't know whether we would live in a life-saving shot for that person who did not know what was happening attempting to save lives. Sadly, someone lost their life. Members in near panic, rightly so, leaving these chambers and walking down and seeing AK-47 in the hands of individuals laying flat on the ground that our brave officers had under their watch. Yes, rioters. But in Greenwood, I want this picture to be embedded in your DNA because you will see economic prosperity, self-sufficiency. Yes, it was known as the Black Wall Street. They viewed, however, black males as fearsome physical threats to their personal safety and the rivals of white women. I don't know what happened in an elevator, allegedly the story. You know, it's always a mystery. But some claim of some insult that occurred. And all of a sudden the word went out and raging leaders of the white community, fine citizens, probably in church, in some church over the weekend, when I say that in their church in that time, because they were always using the Bible wrongly and incorrectly, and I will say that, 
because I believe in a merciful, redemptive Jesus. As a Christian, there are many other faiths, Torah and Quran and other, but I know in the redemptive faith of Christianity, we believe in redemption. And we don't go out because we know that we have had one to sacrifice for us on the cross so that we might be redeemed. We sing that song in our community, let the redeemed say so. But apparently they didn't have that memory. 100,000 black people lived in that area, sold luxury items, 21 restaurants, 30 grocery stores, a hospital, a savings and loan, a post office, three hotels, jewelry and clothing, two movie theaters, a library, pool halls, a bus and cab service, nationally recognized school system, nationally recognized school system, when all of us are fighting for our children to be educated. Today I left Houston and guess what? We have a new resident of Texas, Curtis Jackson, known as 50 Cents. And we were standing together because he was producing with our Mayor Turner and Al Kashani and the school superintendent Gratham and all of elected officials to announce an entrepreneurial program. Can you imagine? To be able to build up our children. This had two black newspapers, six private planes, and I want to say it again, a recognized school system. On May 31st of that year, 35 city blocks went up in flames and 300 persons were murdered and to my knowledge buried in an unmarked grave. 800 were injured and 9,000 were left homeless. Yes, one cannot ignore this history, but it has been ignored. It's been snuffed out. It's been put under. I never knew about it until people like Dr. Crutcher from this great city and various leaders that have brought to our attention even more. But over the years, obviously, in my study of reparations, I've seen the insults that have happened when no one bothered to respond. Brutality that we are now trying to correct by acknowledging in HRES 398, and I hope my colleagues will come to the floor of the House to be able to address it. Let me show you what that massacre generated, and you'll understand as, Madam Speaker, how much time is remaining? Uh, seven, minutes. seven minutes. Thank you so very much. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you saw the bustling town. You saw the bustling town. Then this is a charred Negro who suffered in the Tulsa riots. Yes, I'm like Emmett Till's mother. Let the world see it. This is what happened to an innocent black person. And by the way, the dead included children. Tulsa Historical Society, this is America. And this is a story that we failed to tell. This is what happened. We have more stories to tell. We believe the picture's worth a thousand words. We can never, never overcome that burned, charred body. I showed you what Tulsa looked like, the Black Wall Street, burned out ruins of Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma Library. They have even got it in the library. I don't know how many people have seen it. A wasteland, a literal wasteland, smoke coming up. People's homes gone, wealth gone, never to be presented with any relief, none. They don't even think they got a thank you, not even a thank you. And so our resolution condemns violence and destruction perpetrated against the African-American community of Greenwood. Our resolution has a rejection and active opposition to the false ideology of white supremacy and condemnation of all groups. Our resolution believes in promoting tolerance and unity and taking actions to ensure governmental policies and actions do not force a division, disharmony, or tolerance. Our resolution is calling upon all Americans to celebrate the ethnic, racial, and religious diversity has made the United States great. Our resolution encourages all persons of the United States to reflect upon the history of the United States as an imperfect, but committed journey to establish a more perfect union, our resolution is recognizing the commitment of Congress to acknowledge and learn from the history of racism and racial violence in the United States. Our resolution lays the groundwork for moving to H.R. 40, the Commission to Study and Develop Reparations Proposals, because we can see it in real life. So this is 
part of the Tulsa that never got acknowledged. Let me show you additional fires. So you can see the buildings going up in smoke. We're not making it up. All of these buildings, brick buildings, burned to the ground. Can you imagine someone who survived the post-traumatic stress, the horrors of their life, the willingness not to live anymore, the giving up hope? And people wonder, oh, those lazy Negroes and colored people who worked for over 250 years in bondage. Finally, is that the last? This should be the remaining, I think I want to put the picture of the slave, the individual. And so this is the story we tell tonight. We don't even tell it with a sense of vengeance. We tell it with a sense of dignity, respect and honor. The courage of those people, the genius of those people, they weren't even freed slaves for a hundred years. Look what they created. Look what they created. There's a story on CNN. My great-grandmother survived the 1921 Tulsa massacre. We are not heeding her history. For what was, the wealth, what was once the wealthiest black neighborhood in America became charred ash in a matter of hours. But we have not come to a conclusion to end this kind of white supremacy and racism. I ask unanimous consent to include this in the record. Without objection. I ask unanimous consent to include uh, the uh, H. Res. 398 in the record. Without objection. I ask to include in the record a detailed account of the Tulsa race massacre for the congressional record. Without objection. And then I want to salute those who will be honoring 100 years in the next couple of weeks. I want to very quickly say that. Remember what I said. I knew the history of Christopher Columbus. I didn't know the history of my Native American brothers. I didn't know the history of my own self, slavery. I know Big Mother, which is what we called her. She owned land, and then I knew it was disappeared. I knew I rode in the back of a train to visit her as a little girl. And guess what? Governor Kevin Stitz of Oklahoma was on the commission on the Tulsa Race Massacre, but he signed a bill limiting race and gender curriculums in Oklahoma schools earlier in May. Can you believe it? House Bill 1775. As well, he goes on to not stand for what this commission is all about, truth. So tonight we come to the floor. Remember what I said, I am not in any way throwing darts at anyone, stones at anyone. I am here to raise up the dignity of this man, this person, this body, burned because he was black, prosperous, and ready to serve America. No one can tell me how many in that 1921 massacre had been in World War I, had worn the uniform and come home and made a new life. How no many can tell us out of those who would have lived, would have been ready to go serve in World War II and then on in their progeny, continuing to build this wonderful economic engine. Today, those who remain three living descendants or those who were there, they tell me as I will go to Tulsa, there's one door left. It is a crying shame. And so I lift this story up. And I let you know that the Congressional Black Caucus, yes, the conscience of this nation, has a vital purpose to be able to tell the story. Someone I hope is listening. Someone I hope is listening. Someone I hope heard Brother Torres. I hope they heard Hank Johnson, Barbara Lee. I hope they have heard all of us. Because if we do not know our history, we are doomed to repeat it. We must take the reins lift up the dignity, honor these courageous saints, and we must fight on, pass this resolution on the centennial, pass H.R. 40, the Commission on Study Reparations, pass the American Jobs Plan, pass the American Rescue Plan, lift all boats, for as we do so, God will be the witness for what we have done and the journey we have made. Madam Speaker, I am honored to have been here today 
I'm honored to be part of the Congressional Black Caucus. I'm honored to be part of this House of Representatives. I'm honored to be an American. And I will not have my history denied or my children failing to know that history. That is why we are here today. And let us march on until victory is won. I thank you for yielding. And I now yield back our time.